Hello, good evening, and welcome to this evening's edition of Tiski Sound. My name is Aaron Bastani. Just before we came on to uh, air this evening, uh, we've got the news that Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, is out of intensive care. That's good news. Downing Street says that Boris Johnson is, quote, in extremely good spirits and that he has moved this evening from intensive care back to the ward where he'll receive close monitoring jury during the early phase of his recovery. Recovery uh, seems to be at odds with what we were being told about his initial treatment. But in any case, it uh, sounds to be like uh, sounds to me like he's on the mend. Uh, this evening, I have the great pleasure of being by, uh, of being joined. Sorry, you can see I'm new to this hosting malarkey, as Joe Biden would say, by Michael Walker. How are you doing, Michael? I'm very well. Uh, I've just done my clap for the NHS, 8 p.m. on a Thursday. Slightly fewer participants than, than last time around, but there are sort of more, um, people have got more sort of equipment with them. So they're sort of vuvuzelas now. So sort of like the, the, vo the volume is just as loud, even if the number of people on the balconies is, is somewhat dimmed. We're going to bring also Baskar in, Baskar Sankara at Sunray Sunray. Baskar founded Jacobin Magazine in 2010, aged just 20. I think that's right. He can correct me if that's wrong. He's also the publisher of Catalyst, a journal of theory and strategy and Tribune Magazine in the UK. He's a former vice chair of the Democratic Socialists of America and the author of A Socialist Manifesto, The Case for Radical Politics in an era of extreme inequality, as well as being a columnist for The Guardian, you ask. How are you, Buzz? Are you good? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Getting by, uh, trying to uh, not drive my fiance crazy. We're in a one bedroom uh, apartment, um, but and we've been broadcasting almost every day from the Jacobin YouTube. So uh, I've now been exiled to the tiniest corner of the apartment to to do this one. But otherwise, OK. Were you going to get married this year or is that next year? Next year, next year, yeah. luckily. So so September next year. So hopefully by then everyone will be vaccinated and, you know, up and running, hopefully. Or we'll have herd good. immunity, one or the other. Oh, yeah. That, that word um, kind of is scaring us uh, after after what we heard. But obviously that's that's the uh, the hope. And that's even the goal of partial vaccination. Somehow this whole concept has been getting derailed just because of how incompetent the British government is. But yes, that's what we need. Oh, but you mean via vaccination, yeah. Via oh, vaccination, yeah. Via vaccination, yeah. A, much, a much safer way to get herd immunity right. than what our government would plan. Well, there's, yeah. a, there's a scientific argument that says you can't have herd immunity without vaccinations, but that's mm -hmm. a whole different, uh, whole different thing. Uh, I want to talk to you about so much tonight, uh, Basco, but we're going to try and structure this because we're not going to have you more, for more than 30, 35 minutes. Of course, we're talking about the big news, the big story from yesterday, which was that Bernie Sanders has suspended his campaign, he's left uh, the race to be the Democrat nominee for the presidency. What was your initial reaction to that? Well, I knew it was going to happen at some point. Um, it seems to me that this was slightly premature. I mean, the initial hope was that he was going to run through the end of the primaries in New York and, and some other states had their primary schedule for the end of April. The only thing is, because of the coronavirus, those primaries were postponed. So it became very difficult for him to figure out when exactly should be his departure date. Uh, my mother actually uh, works in the hospitals in, in New York um, City, and she um, is thankfully, hopefully ju now just getting over um, coronavirus. And her immediate text to me um, this, this morning was, you know, Bernie was the only one out there. And she's a mainstream Democrat, but, but she appreciated that Bernie was out there. She was sad that she was gone. And that makes me think that maybe he could have, you know, been around, used the bully pulpit of running for president, given more press conference, been in the media circuit for the next couple of months because Biden is is completely absent. He's not providing any leadership. Trump is utterly incompetent at best. And that's probably a good thing because if he was more actively trying to do his agenda, it might actually cause more harm for working people. So, you know, we could question the timing, but, you know, this race is exhausting. He also stopped fundraising and stopped doing that kind of stuff about a month ago. So, you know, he has limited reserves of cash. He wants to make sure that his staff are taken care of with at least a couple months uh, severance. Uh, so all those factors probably played into his decision. Um, the timing is a slight surprise, but, you know, we knew it was coming, unfortunately. Was it the first you heard of it when he relayed the information on Twitter yesterday or were you aware uh, of all that? I got a one hour uh, heads up maybe even 50 minutes so enough to get maybe one paragraph of a piece down but not uh, not not anything more than that but you know obviously um you know the campaign's first priority is letting staff know and giving staff a heads up and by then the, these campaigns in the u.s are so big that that means you know there's a couple thousand people who know so word word uh you know gets around um but you know again um 
this was a race with over a dozen contenders, and many of them very serious contenders, uh, not just mayors of South Bend, Indiana, and stuff like that, but actually, you know, senators and governors and, and people who had real credibility and, and, and bases. And Sanders outlasted them all. Unfortunately, he uh, couldn't outlast uh, Joe Biden, but, uh, you know, that should be some some consolation that he ran a very competitive campaign. I'm sure it was exhausting. So he's uh, now taking a break. But one thing I really liked about his speech is a lot of it is, um, is a uh, present tense call for continuing our movement and continuing the struggle for justice. It didn't sound like an ordinary uh, concession uh, speech. So we're going to go to uh, his video yesterday, which basically he tweeted the announcement of him being suspended, uh, his campaign being suspended, rather. Important to say, his name will still be on the ballot, as I understand it, Basco. Maybe you can correct me, but he just isn't. His name will be on the ballot in most places. Um, in a few states like New York, his name might not, in fact, be on the ballot because he suspended his campaign. It's a little bit yeah. complicated. Uh, it's, the U.S. electoral law is a mess. It varies state by state. Um, but yes, people in most places will be able to vote for Bernie Sanders, and they should vote for Bernie Sanders because we'll be able to shape more of the Democratic Party platform during our convention. Uh, with our delegates. And there's still going to be hundreds of Bernie delegates out there, a lot of them Democratic Socialists. You know, it means a little bit less than it does in a country with more um, rigid party structures, like in the UK, like uh, what happens at conference means more uh, than what will happen at the, the DNC if they manage to hold this thing in, in August. But people should still vote for Bernie Sanders. I think it'll send an important uh, and powerful message. So we're going to go to what was effectively his concession speech. This is going to be uh, cut into two pieces, but we're going to go to the first bit now. So let's let's roll that, Fox. I can't imagine that any candidate has ever been blessed with a stronger and more dedicated group of people who have taken our message to every part of this country. And I want to thank all of those who made the music and the art an integral part of our campaign. I want to thank all of you who spoke to your friends and neighbors posted on social media and worked as hard as you could to make this a better country. And now if we can just go to uh, the second clip, broadly says the same thing. Together we have transformed American consciousness as to what kind of nation we can become and have taken this country a major step forward in the never ending struggle for economic justice, social justice, racial justice, and environmental justice. Bazkar, first thoughts. Do you, I mean, if I'm going to be really, really mm -hmm. candid, it's kind of bullshit, right? I mean, the guy was the favourite to be the to be the Democrat nominee just a couple of months ago. Joe Biden had never won a primary ever. To to be bowing out in, in in early April. I mean, did you ever expect that? Um, well, throughout most of this race, Sanders was not the favourite. Uh, he was polling beyond, behind Biden for most of the last six months, besides for this brief kind of window where we were ahead. Uh, for a period, it looked like his campaign was completely down and out. He was in some polls in the single um, digits. He just had a heart attack. Elizabeth Warren was capturing a lot of uh, progressive momentum. And, and this is, you know, again, I use that word loosely. These people are worse than, than your soft left in the UK. Uh, Labor Party. I mean, but she was capturing some of these these NGOs and some of these types. Um, and again, I, I think there there is mistakes in claiming easy um, victories. But the Sanders campaign over the last five years really went from from completely fringe and marginal and meaningless to a campaign that has reshaped national priorities around key issues like Medicare for all like universal child care, like a Green New Deal, which was first popularized in the Sanders campaign in 2016, which have had international ramifications, mm -hmm. uh, the host of, of new politicians like AOC and others. So it's really, I think now is the time to highlight what a long shot this was and what's actually been accomplished. You know, Jeremy Corbyn, that was quite the accomplishment, but this is one guy in a small cohort of 10, 20 survivors who managed to get to um, to win the leadership contest. Of course, an incredible long shot story. But Sanders didn't even have that cohort of a dozen or so people around him. This was one isolated voice in the wilderness who managed to now build 
a roster of young politicians around him. So we went from a movement that was on life support, a movement that was almost completely dead, to something that actually exists as an opposition movement in the United States. And I think Bernie Sanders deserves some credit uh, for that. So I, I thought that either at this point, he would be the presumptive nominee, mm. or he would be at the race. In many ways, um, it sounds silly because so many of the delegates haven't been aligned, but um, Super Tuesday was really our cutoff state. A lot of the earlier uh, rounds uh, favored us. So it just happened to work out that we like oriented the schedule through our victories within the Democratic Party uh, so that we had the first, um, you know, the first states were, were mostly states that we had, uh, we thought we had a chance to win. And, you know, it, it, it's tough. We came up, we came close, but, um, but I'm, I'm not completely um, surprised. Michael, I'm going to bring you in. You, um, you don't pull your punches uh, and you've been very patient and waiting. Uh, what, what did you think of uh, Sanders' concession uh, there, Michael? Do you think, do you think that, that there's a danger, there's a possibility that the left kind of kids itself about the, the consequences of what has ultimately been a, a failed tilt for the presidency? And is, that, is there a parallel there perhaps with the legacy, quote unquote, of Corbynism here in the UK? Well, I, I mean, I agree with Pascal that the, the Bernie Sanders campaign has been a, a massive achievement for socialism on a hostile terrain. And I think, you know, what, what he has achieved over the past four years is is incredible. Um, I mean, how one reacts to it is is difficult, isn't it? Because, I mean, if you're looking at it in terms of, oh, he failed, he, he could have done better. We should be aiming for the top. We should be aiming for the presidency. It's it's almost harder with the case of, of Bernie Sanders. I've said this before on, on the show. When you, when you look at Jeremy Corbyn, and you say, why did he not become prime minister? It's quite easy to to list a bunch of mistakes that were made, a bunch of strategic errors, um, which really meant that you know the the potential of left populism in Britain uh, wasn't realised to its full extent. We could argue because of various hiccups along the way. It's harder to make that argument with Bernie Sanders. I think he was you know a man with incredible discipline, um, ran a campaign which constantly spoke in a language that ordinary people could understand. Um, and it seemed that even though sort of he 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 did what he was doing very well, let's put it that way, an incredibly comp incredibly competent politician, it seemed like there was a thirty percent ceiling um, on his support in the the Democratic primary electorate. And I mean that that does require one to, I suppose, step back and reassess what what you're going to aim to what you're going to aim to do. Um, during the long game, because in a way it wasn't, I don't really think Bernie Sanders' campaign showed the failure of Bernie Sanders. I think it showed probably both the potential and the limits of left populism. I'm going to come back to Baskar. Baskar, can I ask you a question? Because it's relevant for us here in the UK as well. We were we were talking about this with Yanis Varoufakis last night. And I think the, the there is a there is a parallel between, amongst many parallels, between Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders. Although I agree that Bernie Sanders, I actually think, as a politician, dealt with a very bad hand much better. Mm -hmm. And I think he's a sensational politician, Bernie Sanders. Okay. Uh, but I think one parallel is that the center left was not willing to give the left leadership within a broader coalition in the same way, way that the center right was to the right. In the US, of course, you've got Trump more recently, you've okay. got Johnson, but also historically, Thatcher, Reagan. Is that your sense? If there is a, if there is a, and of course there is a, a, a panoply of reasons why it didn't work out, but if there's a sort of single sociological explanation, it's that the broad political center within the Democratic Party simply wasn't willing to accept the possibility of Bernie Sanders being their candidate. Well, I think that's true of establishment politicians in the Democratic Party. Bernie Sanders, people will focus on little tactical things like, oh, he didn't pick up the phone. He didn't call this or that politician. And yes, I agree. He probably should have picked up the phone a few more times and did a bit more uh, glad handing and backroom horse trading that he, you know, just is in his disposition, uh, he's, uh, you know, against. Um, but I think the context is a little bit different. If you think about it one way, these Democratic Party politicians were still competing against Bernie Sanders in a primary. It'd be one thing if they were undermining a Sanders campaign in the lead up to a general election. Beyond that, I think it's worth noting that because UK politics is structured differently, these MPs in the parliamentary group 
in the Labour Party that opposed Corbyn and undermined him in every way were undermining already the leader of an opposition, were undermining their own party's prospects in a general um, election. In the U.S., it's it's a it's a hard thing to say that they should have rallied around Bernie Sanders because he had the lead briefly um, after Nevada. In fact, a lot of these establishment politicians instead rallied around Biden, the candidate that was closer to them ideologically, and they ended up winning. Um, so it's it's this sounds like I'm I'm letting our opponents in the Democratic Party off the off the hooks, but I think the situation is kind of different. I think what happened to Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour Party, is that much more egregious because they paved the way for declining favorability rates for for Jeremy Corbyn. They've paved the way for the media offensive against Bernie Sanders, uh, against Jeremy Corbyn, and they paved the way for another, you know, half decade at least of Tory rule. So I think, you know, if anything, what what happened in the UK was even more uh, egregious. But um, obviously, the center left does not want a coalition under left leadership. So the question is, do you have the social forces to make that happen? I think we thought the base for left populism was already there. Now, in hindsight, it sounds like we're just saying, all right, everything's fine. We're going to win in the long run. But what that is, is a realization that we're going to need more organizing. We're going to need a slower, more patient strategy over the next 10, 15 years to build that coalition that we thought we already had. You know, I thought a month and a half ago, and I'm normally incredibly pessimistic, I thought we were already there. You know, I thought that after Nevada, we showed that we had this coalition of young uh, workers, of Latinos, of first-time voters, and we, we had enough of these people that they would turn out and change some sort of electoral calculus. I, it seemed like we were going to sneak through the back door and actually elect without much of a social base at all this person president. And from that basis, he would be able to use the bully pulpit to encourage organizing and, and really change American politics. And we were pretty close. The left populist gamble almost worked. I'm definitely not going back to the kind of fringe uh, sectarian politics that, that I engage with for, for a portion of my adult life, because I've, I've, seen, I've seen this um, almost succeed. Um, but I, I am, I guess, back to the old awareness that this is going to be a long struggle and to require a lot of organizing. And we should not overestimate our social base. And I think both in the US and the UK, we overestimated things. We did it after 2016. Uh, you guys did it after uh, 2017. I just want to say you're watching uh, Tiski Sauer on Navarra Media. Uh, right now, we have uh, around 1,200 people watching, only 260 thumbs. Please smash the like button. It means the world to us. Uh, we'll be taking questions towards the end. Uh, so please put them on the hashtag, hashtag Tiski Sauer, or put them in the comments section with the rocket uh, emoji. Always appreciate it. Uh, as well as liking the video in the description, there is a tweet with this video if you want more people to see this. We think that's a good idea. Why not give it a retweet? Uh, we're going to skip a very funny video uh, by Cardi B uh, because we probably don't have time. We're now going to go straight to a video of Joe Biden. I guess I want to talk about this a little bit more with you before we talk about the US economy and then let you get on with your day, Bazkar. Uh, this is Joe Biden uh, last night, I believe, talking on, I think it was MSNBC. So let's get that up, Fox. And I talk about restoring the soul of America. You're seeing the soul of America now. Look what Americans are doing. Average Americans, they're not asking anything about, they're not talking about divisions based on race or ethnicity or any of that malarkey. What they're talking about is they're reaching out and helping everyone. Look. CNN, my apologies. Uh, I would implore anybody watching that to go and see the whole video on Twitter. Uh, just generally speaking, I mean, that offers a snapshot, Baskar. Can Joe Biden beat Donald Trump? Uh, yes, yes, he can beat Donald Trump uh, because American politics are so hyper polarized. Um, I could run for U.S. president and be guaranteed 45 percent of the vote. And I'm on record saying nice things, not just about Castro, but about like Muammar Gaddafi. You know, just kidding. Gaddafi is a bad guy. Um, but, you know, that 45 percent base is there. It's a hyper polarized presidential system. Um and from there, anything could happen, right? Uh, Trump is in, is pretty unpopular. Uh, he won in the Rust Belt and in in this part of the the, the U.S. Uh, states like Michigan, the state like Pennsylvania. He won by the narrowest of margins in in uh, 2016. He lost the popular vote. Um, 
there's every reason to think that Biden can, in fact, win this election. Does that mean he's the strongest candidate? Of course not. And does that mean if he squeaks into this election, uh, whether he'll be able to change anything or whether he'll be able to flip Congress as well? So remember, it's a presidential system. So there's very much the possibility that Biden will be in, but Congress will still be split. So legislation can't get passed in the in the U.S. You know, this is one reason why our, our system is so um, is, is caught in this malaise. Um, so I think it's a mistake for the left to say Biden can't win. We could have made an argument. I truly do believe Sanders was a stronger general election candidate. And I also believe that Sanders winning would pave the way to actual transformation, to actual legislation being passed, to actual reforms being made. And also that Sanders' base is really, you know, it sounds like a cliche, this sounds like demographic destiny, but his base, it's not just young college students. It's young people under the age of 45, mm. even under the age of 50, went for Sanders. It's Latino workers. It's people in the Southwest. Right now, there's a poll that just came out today that said among, I have to double check the exact age group, but I think it was like 28 to 36 or 28 to 34, Biden and Trump are virtually tied. You know, this is a demographic that went heavily, even for Hillary Clinton, much less Obama. Biden is not reaching the people he should be reaching, and it's going to be a lot harder with him. But, you know, I, I think he, he stands a, a chance of, of winning. It's a, it's a toss up. I can't I can't see either way. OK, so we're going to go to a, a quick video of Donald Trump commenting on on recent events. So let's pull that up. And I hope that a lot of Bernie Sanders people, just like they did last time, we got a tremendous percentage of Bernie people. And I think they voted for me largely because of trade, because Bernie and I agree on trade. We agree that the United States has been ripped off by virtually every country they do business with. The difference is I've done a lot about it and I'm doing more about it. And we've made incredible trade deals. So the, the claim there is that uh, Trump won multiple Bernie people. We don't need to go into the, the veracity of that. Do you think there's probably something to it, though, however, that many people who would have campaigned for Sanders will not campaign for Sanders? Many people who felt mm -hmm. like they had skin in the game with Sanders uh, won't feel like that with with, Bo with Joe Biden. Yeah, uh, I, it'll be less it'll be less voting defections, but it'll be that people not volunteering, people not campaigning, even if they hold their nose and vote for Biden. And in the states that matter, the Rust Belt states, the states that basically decided it last time, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Ohio, I mean, that, there is a there is a a section, however, of workers, working people, white working class people who didn't vote for Hillary, who voted for Trump. Do you think Biden can win them back or would Sanders have been better placed? Um, I think Biden has a chance to to maybe win those some, some of those workers back, if only because there's been disillusionment about what yeah. Trump has actually done. Uh, people are seeing through a lot of the, the facade of Trump. But one thing that I would caution is that in a crisis, people tend to gravitate towards existing leaders. Trump's handling this crisis pretty poorly. But look at the approval rating so surge uh, since December in the UK for, for Boris Johnson. Look at uh, basically in every country except for Brazil, incumbents, as far as I've seen, have benefited from this crisis. People want stability. They don't want things shaken up in a time of, of crisis. Um, and you know that's that's a strong case for uh, for Trump, but but in general, in these areas, I think Biden can win back um, some of these voters. Um, and in fact, uh, Hillary Clinton might be a fluke in some states. Like I, I don't think Michigan and Minnesota are really competitive states for Republicans in the in the long run. Um, I, I I think that Hillary Clinton was in a way a uniquely bad candidate. Mm. And again. This is between this and a few other things I said tonight. This is like my total capitulation to liberalism. But there is, of course, something to I don't think a majority of voters, but I think there's obviously three, four percent of the, the electorate that wouldn't want to vote for a woman, a woman, that, but who would vote for um, an old, equally incompetent, equally right wing man and in, 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 um, Joe Biden. And I think obviously in such a, with some slim margins uh, that could uh, make a difference in this election. I wanted to come in and ask specifically about your role, Baskar, in, in the coming general election, because I saw a reference to Jacobin and Chapo and the whole sort of left media sphere. I think it was from Matt Iglesias from, from Vox. And he was saying that, you know, even if even if Bernie endorses Biden, there's going to be some holdouts who are un, who are unwilling to do so. And I'm wondering, you know, what how are you thinking about this strategically? Because one argument is to say, 
well, for one, you're not infused by this guy for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, so why would you go out and, and bat for him and campaign for him? The other argument is, you know, one of the arguments as to how the left can have leverage in the next round of primaries is to say, look, you, you need us to campaign for you, so vote for our candidate. Mm-hmm. But also there could there could be a third sort of consideration to make, which is many people are saying, you know, one of the limits of Bernie Sanders was that he wasn't seen as a Democrat. He wasn't seen as someone who plays for that team. So do you think there will be some people potentially on the Bernie wing who are going to go all out to show up to show, look, we are proper Democrats. We will campaign properly for Biden. Um, bring us into the fold with the idea that that will give them more legitimacy the next time around. Uh, on the last count, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I think it is a complicated situation because we should say that these two candidates are not equally are not the same. You know, Biden is uh, a lesser evil compared to Donald Trump. That is, in fact, true. It's true on 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 everything. Even this this whitewashing of of Trump's record on imperialism, which makes it seem like he's some sort of anti imperialist force. No, they're both bad on 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 foreign policy. There's nothing good about what Donald Trump is doing is doing there. But beyond that, as Marxists, we should think about social forces. Now, one is a centrist candidate who we don't like for all sorts of reasons, who's going to accumulate whatever institutional forces exist in the progressive movement in the US. Uh, a lot of them are, are NGOs and, and, other, and other groups, uh, but also our, our trade unions. They're all going to back and rally behind Joe Biden. He's going to, in some way, have to be accountable to them, at least not in that direction from time to time. Of course, we know the record of, of betrayal from Democrats, just like the b- record of betrayal from from labor uh, leaders in, in, in the past. On the other hand, is a guy who's a right populist leader with a coalition that has every big capitalist in the country um, behind him, and in a coalition that has really nasty, virulently right-wing racist elements uh, behind him. So put it that way, I mean, who would we rather be in opposition to? I'd rather be in opposition uh, just for the sake of the the constituencies and the, the social base and the working people of this this country that, that we say we're we're engaging in politics for um, with with Joe Biden. Now, I can't though go out there and canvas for Joe Biden like a Joe Biden supporter. Uh, th- there's nothing in Joe Biden's platform that's a big concession to the left. There's nothing in there that signals that he wants our support. Now, if I was in a swing state and my vote could make the difference between Trump or Biden getting elected, sure, I, I'll pull the lever for, for Biden. This isn't about me and what makes me feel good morally. You know, it might make me feel good morally to write in Bernie Sanders, but politics isn't about that. But what I will do in November, even though I won't canvass for Joe Biden, and also because I'm in New York, I won't vote for the guy, uh, I will uh, canvass for down-ballot progressive candidates, and I will uh, canvas uh, to the extent we can with coronavirus. Uh, I mean, I actually go out there and knock on doors and talk to people. Uh, I, I will do it for uh, Medicare for all and for our key issues. And I will try to cement a uh, base around the Bernie Sanders movement so we can figure out how do we regroup left populists and democratic socialists and others who want an alternative within and outside the Democratic Party. I think that's the way forward. Bernie Sanders will be out there and he will be actively campaigning for Joe Biden. Uh, I, I think we shouldn't oppose him for that. That's what he said he'll do. He did 40 events for Hillary Clinton. Don't believe you know liberals when they tell you he undermined Hillary Clinton. No, he was out there uh, campaigning for her. Um, I don't, you know, th- I, that's that's what he's going to do. And he's going to take far more of the, the base uh, with him than people on the far left can. But our role is a little bit different. We're trying to build an opposition movement. Uh, I, I think by saying there's no difference between Trump and Biden, we could end up being scapegoats for Biden's own deficiencies. We have to prevent that. But but there's no way I think we should encourage DSA chapters to go out there and actively expend our finite resources canvassing for Biden when we could canvass for good down ballot progressive candidates and for our issues like Medicare for all. Uh, we're going to quickly go very quickly before we let you go, uh, Baskar, to look at the US unemployment statistics before we do sort of finish up with the Sanders Biden story. Just want to say it's really important to know that the two uh, effects of the two candidates to be uh, the next president of the United States, Trump, Biden, both currently facing allegations of either sexual assault or harassment. Uh, how, how big is that? Is that is that going to be a part of the kind of conversation ahead of uh, November, December, Baskar, or is it just going to be sidelined, do you think? 
Well, I think what we've seen now is that that liberal Democrats were more than willing to use Me Too in political contexts when it when it suited them, but are are willing to put allegations, bury them under the the rug uh, when um, you know when it when it doesn't um, suit them. Obviously, Trump can't really um, you know uh, attack. Biden on this issue, given his own past and history. But if there's one candidate who might be able to figure out a way just to, uh, you know, uh, square that circle and, and to, to make that happen, then uh, then it would be uh, Trump. But I imagine that this is going to be uh, dismissed and buried under the rug and not uh, talked about. And also, sometimes it seems like nothing matters anymore. Like Donald Trump had sex with a porn star while his wife was pregnant and nobody cares. Like, in Bill Clinton, in that, that Ken Starr report, uh, it said that the footnotes of the Ken Starr report said that he performed an act that Ken Starr's report called anal lingus in the Oval Office. Nobody seems to care. Nothing matters anymore. It's, it's you yeah, know, this is, this is the world we live in. We're going to move on uh, now. Uh, well, something that does definitely matter to a lot of Americans, if we can just get this up, graphic one. U.S. jobless figures, quite a remarkable story unfolding right now. U.S. weekly jobless claims mount by another 6.6 .6 million. Latest figures take cumulative total to almost 17 million since March lockdowns began. Uh, the biggest weekly increase until the coronavirus crisis was, I believe, 700,000, wasn't it, Baskar? Uh, that was uh, beaten a couple of weeks ago by 500%. It went up to 3.5 million, 3.2, 3.3 million. It was then doubled the week after that. It's then stayed there again. This obviously never happened before at this, at this, with this intensity, with this velocity. How, how big a shock is it going to be to U.S. society? How big a shock is it going to be to American politics? And I'm not just talking about November, December, this presidential race, this huge upsurge in people taking unemployment benefit, who probably mm -hmm. never expected they would have to do that. Uh, you know, how, how big should we think about these consequences being? Well, first of all, just think about what a what a terrible. Uh, policy this is for working people, that you have to lose your job in order to get unemployment uh, benefits. So the state is still paying the money, but now these people are jobless and will have to find new work after this thing is over if they're able. Whereas in the UK, basically the same expenditure was spent just for covering 80% of workers' uh, furloughs. So at least they still are in stable in employment. Um, so, I mean, that's one thing to consider, the fact that these people are, are unemployed. And obviously the unemployment rolls would be exploding even more in the UK if there wasn't this this system of, of just covering uh, paying back employers to keep people on uh, who are who are furloughed. Um, now, I guess one thing we have to think about as socialists is that so many of the policies have been on the demand side. Like, how do we stimulate demand by putting cash in people's pockets, making sure they're getting unemployment assistance or whatnot? But if this unemployment starts to impact the supply side, then you know you're going to have a much longer um, recovery. And in certain sectors, there might not ever be recovery. So after the recession, for example, in, in 2008, you know, you saw the plummeting of certain um, industrial productions, manufacturing or whatnot. But then after the, the, um, the immediate shock was over, there was kind of the doubling down of production in those, those areas, making up for some of the lost ground. Well, in the service sector, which employs so many millions of Americans in low wage service sector jobs, it's not like people are going to go out and are going to eat uh, double the meals out. If anything, even after the government says it's safe to go out and hang out at bars and, and eat at restaurants, uh, people are, are going to change their behaviors a bit. They probably won't do it uh, that much in, in mass. So I think this is going to be a longer, deeper rooted uh, crisis. I think this is going to empower workers in certain sectors, like a, a so-called essential workers, the same workers that they were uh, casting aside before, but now are considered essential workers in supply and logistics. They might have more bar bargaining power. They might be able to go out and go on strike. Uh, so we have to think of this as an opportunity to organize in certain sectors. Um, but you know, there's there's no way to really give a firm answer about how long this thing will will go on. Uh, remember, economists were predicting a uh, recession anyway uh, later this year. So this is only going to compound uh, the deeper structural problems that are going on in this economy. And obviously, you know, this crisis is going to be resolved like all crises within capitalism on the backs of the working class, especially because, you know, the, the left and labor movements are at a point of historic weakness. You know, we're not in power uh, basically um, anywhere in the advanced capitalist world. And even where we are in power, we're part of uh, weak coalition governments without much backing uh, from extra parliamentary uh, movements. It's, it's going to be a very 
a uh, tough time for us. Um, I think the thing that gives me consolation as a socialist is just remembering that our politics are not just about morality and ethics and about doing the right thing. You know, of course, you know, we try to be moral and ethical and, and, and to care for, for one another and embrace solidarity. Our politics are rooted also in an objective contradiction and a, a contradiction between uh, us living in a class society and some people having all the power and wealth and other people having none of it. And those people are going to organize and are going to fight back as long as they're living in class society. So socialism can never go away. Class struggle can never go away. But, you know, the next couple of years is going to be you know, even tougher than, than the last uh, few have been. OK, Pascal, thanks for joining us. You've been great. Best of luck. Uh, and if people thanks. want to follow you on Twitter at Sunray Sunray, I'm sure we'll stay in touch. All right. Take care, comrades. Best Cheers. Bye. See ya. Great guy, huh? I love what, Pascal. What a CV for his age. We're going to go quickly now to a couple of really big stories. I mean, these would be, in any other day, would be huge stories. Uh, first one here, this is extraordinary. Uh, this is in the FT. Most UK businesses are unsure they can survive the coronavirus. Let me just get this up. Uh, as you can see, construction, entertainment and food services among most pessimistic sectors. I'm going to bring up a quote here. Uh, if it's coming on screen, it should be. Uh, the majority of UK businesses are not confident they have the financial resources to stay open during the coronavirus pandemic. According to an official survey, as data shows the economy uh, contracted even before the disease struck, which is very, very striking. Uh, according to the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, Economic Research Centre, the UK economy could shrink by 5% in the first quarter, which is particularly strange when you think that the lockdown didn't start until mid-March. Uh, and if the lockdown continues by between 15% and 25%, in the second quarter, Michael, this is this is quite significant, isn't it? Fifty nine percent of four thousand six hundred businesses that replied to a survey didn't think they could continue operating through the crisis, which would indicate they won't see the other side of it. To clarify those words, yep. Yeah, so there's two. I mean, there's there's two sort of facts you presented, and I think they're both very different in terms of how we should look at them. So, in a way, a recession of between fifteen and twenty five percent that's not a policy failure. That's something that we we actually quite want to see because what we want to see is economic activity dampening down. We want people to you know stop moving about so much, and that means that the policy is successful as far as businesses stop functioning during this period. Um, but that's very different to this idea that fifty nine percent of businesses think they might go bankrupt in this period because what the government you know have said they want to do, and I don't see that much reason to to not take them at their word on this, is to sort of freeze the economy and to have businesses survive until this this crisis is over when they can start when they can boot back up again and start functioning again what it seems like um with policy as it currently is maybe that's because it's been based too much on loans and small businesses aren't you know interested in in taking on more debt um when you know as as Bascar said when they reopen it's not as if people are going to buy twice as many meals afterwards um so they've got a big black hole in their finances which alone won't fill they need they need cash grants um, and so it does seem like not only will we be freezing the economy over the next three, six months, which is a good thing, um, but there will be many good businesses that that die um, over that same period of time. I mean, also, it's really dramatic. go bankrupt. Uh, well, they, yeah, they'll, they'll expire. Um, they, will, they will no longer exist. I suppose yeah. That is. And if you look at as well, this is a, the, the important thing is we've not gone from like even healthy economic growth isn't even the right word. You know, even just like normal by the standards of the last 30, 40 years growth, two, three percent per annum. Basically, towards the end of last year, it was zero percent growth. I mean, you could say that because investment was being held back because of Brexit or whatever. Um, but the first quarter to already see a contraction would suggest that we were sort of hovering at zero anyway. And this is a really important point. You know, the economic context within which this crisis has happened is already terrible. You know, there were already high street businesses going bankrupt. You know, already we had a, a housing crisis, not enough homes were being built. Uh, and so I think, you know, as we've said repeatedly, what this will do is intensify preceding crises as much as be this kind of exogenous shock. That's the word we keep on using, which is a bit different to the 70s. You know, the oil crisis happened in the 70s. There was rising home ownership, rising living standards. This crisis is happening in a very different environment. Uh, and a very scary one. Bring up a quote here from Paul Dales, chief UK economist at Consultancy Capital Economics, said that February's contraction, uh, which is you know before March, looked like the calm before the storm of a lifetime. 
uh, because the coronavirus lockdown will, quote, mean that in March and April, GDP will fall at speed and magnitude no one has ever seen and no economy has ever experienced before. But as you've said, Michael, I suppose that's that's to be expected. And that's actually the intention of the lockdown. Yeah, I mean, that's a good thing. And I mean, as you say, you, you know, this crisis, as it comes along, will intensify um, pre-existing crises which, crises, which sort of underlie the system. So indebtedness of firms and and firms with a lot of fixed cost in industries that might not be particularly profitable at this point in time. I think it is worth saying that it could also be an opportunity if the government is willing to take, you know, to adopt the right policies during and after this thing. So so one reason we'd ha we've had such anemic growth um, over the past decade is because of the high levels of indebtedness and low inflation, which means that those those debts don't go down. Um, even this is we talked about this when James Medway was on the show. Um, even you know moderate centrist figures, and um, like the director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, is suggesting that one way um, that we might come out of this crisis is that you've got the government with with huge debts, and unlike in two thousand and eight when they try and get down those debts by um, cutting wages and cutting social benefits, they could decide to accept higher levels of inflation, so pump money into the economy, allow inflation to rise, and that would not only you know lower government debts because they've become less less valuable, but also private debts. And so if if we do have a sort of refoundation of, of a Keynesian Keynesian model where we accept high inflation, that could I mean that that could resolve some of the contradictions of capitalism that we currently have. If 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 a new settlement is found, obviously that's there's going to be many people whose interests that doesn't serve, big asset holders. Mm. Um and I mean the Tories will worry about the kickback that they might experience from from homeowners if they do that. Well, there's going to have to be huge debt write-offs. With or without inflation, I think you're going to have to see huge debt write-offs, corporate debt, sovereign debt, personal debt. Uh, we've got 1,455 people watching, only 630 thumbs. Please, please smash the like button. And if you like what you're watching, go to navaramedia.com slash support. We've been trying to do daily shows for the duration of this crisis. We also have a daily podcast. Uh, you can find that on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, called The Burner. A great podcast. This is also on a podcast. We often don't say that. You can also find that on those exact same platforms. If you are listening, thank you very much. Consider giving us a review, particularly on iTunes. Really helps us with the algorithm. We've now got separate um, feeds for The Burner and for Navarra Media. Hopefully, we'll have a feed for Siski Sour soon. Uh, and let's try and break 1,500 watching tonight. Uh, not every show can be box office with Yanis Varoufakis, but 1500. I know it's going to mean the world to Michael Walker. Another huge story, and this is again just massive. Uh, it seems that Britain is already living amid a rent strike. Uh, this is again from the FT. UK tenants pay less than half owed in rent. Um, so if you've been falling behind with your rent, you are not alone. Uh, many decide to hold on to cash, makes sense, triggering disputes with landlords in commercial and residential sectors. Uh, I'm going to pull up a quote here. Just 48% of tenants paid on time and in full on the latest rent day, which for commercial tenants was March 25th, and which varies for residential contracts according to data compiled by Remit Consulting from six leading property management companies covering close to 80,000 leases. So it's a big sample. Uh, with shops, uh, shops and offices closed and thousands of employees furloughed nationwide, many have decided to hold on to cash rather than pay rent. Again, a very wise move. A move that has triggered disputes between landlords and tenants in the past fortnight. Retail landlords, whose tenants have mostly been forced to close as a result of the pandemic, took 41% of rents. Residential landlords fared little better, taking 44% of what they were due. Michael, this is a huge story, isn't it? I mean, it is. I mean, one thing that, I mean, maybe um, it does amuse me is, is how anarchic the response was in many ways by the government to this particular crisis. So if you, you're you reading this and yeah, half of the people aren't paying their rents. Sometimes this is agreed with landlords. Sometimes the landlords are, are really annoyed yeah. about it and there's a, a dispute going on. Sometimes you've got landlords threatening their tenants and saying, you've got to pay us. And the government have really taken a step back and said, we all want you to do the right thing. Mm. You know, uh, uh, they haven't explain quite what that's going to be and they're not going to enforce anyone's rights over this period so it's very odd uh, it reminds me in the in the press conference this afternoon uh it was dominic raab who was who was giving this one uh, he was asked by i think an itv journalist about a worker who was blind who was being forced to go into work who wanted to be furloughed but the the boss was was refusing to do that and dominic raab's answer was just well we would hope their bosses would do the right thing you know and and so they've their response to this crisis, other than, you know, we've, we've talked about how, you know, the furloughing scheme 
offering 80 percent of, of of workers wages is is fairly ambitious they've left it all down to the you know the decisions of bosses and the decisions of landlords um which you know sometimes creates disputes often i think just creates exploitation but in any case it's yeah, it's, it's a very anarchic way of dealing with all of this i think it's kind of crazy i mean it could get out of, you could see it getting out of hand quite quickly um if the government isn't seen to be sort of exercising authority which right now it is uh, in their defense final well, story they're not in this, they're not in this uh, that's the point though because no. in in terms of rents what they've basically said yeah. is we're not changing the laws we're just not going to enforce them for this period yeah and this is basically what we're seeing as the outcome of that but i mean generally speaking uh this is a decision that's being taken by businesses because they're worried about you know we're not furloughed workers will get money but they won't be able to pay those furloughed workers until money comes through i think sometime this month and they're, you know, cash is king. They're holding on to it for now, which, so it's a sensible thing to do. But, and I know what you're saying, but this is the outlier, right? And there is a lot of, there is a coherent policy on furloughing workers on uh, lines of credit, et cetera. And you just think it, it could, it could disintegrate quite quickly because like you say, this is very anarchic. Um, final story. And then we're going to go to questions. Uh, Fox is always, Fox is just the ultra professional. Give Fox a big shout out. We did start five minutes late, so we'll, we'll have a couple of questions at the end. We have five minutes over. I'm sorry, Fox. Um, uh, we didn't start bang on time this evening. Final story. This is Keir Starmer, swaying Starmer. Uh, this is from last night. He appeared on Robert Peston. We're going to see the concluding part of a clip, which you can find on his Twitter feed. Until we know quite whether we've reached the top of the curve or not, sure. it's very difficult to put a timetable on it. But Robert, look, I mean, I'm the opposition. I'm, I'm asking sure. the government to tell us what their exit strategy is. Yeah, yeah. I'm not the decision no, no, maker no, here. No, no, of course. Um, but I just agree not, but, with you. But just... What people want is that exit sure. strategy. Michael, what do you think of that um, uh, interview, the whole thing? I'm trying to give the guy the benefit of the doubt, you know. It's like he's 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 now the leader of the of the main opposition party, the Labour Party, a party of which I'm a member. I want him to do well, but I watched the whole interview on Peston and like it was it was crap. It was and it was crap because he just didn't really say anything, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean there was there was a few things that annoyed me about it. So one at the beginning, he sort of misled people actually about antigen testing. Mm -hmm. So he said that when it comes to an exit strategy, antigen testing, testing as to whether or not you have coronavirus, that can only help us get frontline workers back to the front line. Now, what that ignores is the role that testing, whether you, you have it at this point in time, um, can be a central plank of a test and trace policy, which is one route out of this. So he was being, to me, actively misleading in that situation and actively misleading by just parroting the government line. Yeah. And you'd have thought as, you know, I, I, I agree. We, we we both said on Monday that this idea that you should oppose for opposition's sake, one, that doesn't make sense in, in normal times, but it definitely doesn't make sense now. But what seems to have happened with Starmer is that he's so wary about seeming to oppose anything whatsoever that he's basically just repeating Matt Hancock and seeming just as evasive as the government. Because obviously the government, when they're asked a question, they can't give a particularly fulsome answer because what they've got to do is cover their own backs, mm. justify past mistakes, etc. cetera. Um, whereas Keir Starmer, at least, he should be able to be incredibly frank. So when he was asked, why is it that, that Denmark and Norway and Austria are able to start coming out of lockdowns now? The answer is they went into lockdown early, which means that community transmission wasn't quite as severe as it was here, which means that they've managed to get, um, you know, cases lower sooner. Um, and obviously, Matt Hancock isn't going to be able to say that because that, you know, condemns government policy to some degree, but Keir Starmer could, and he didn't. And that last answer there, the one you just played, I thought also yeah. was, I mean, pathetic, frankly, this idea, we're not the government, we're not making the decisions, all we do is ask questions. I mean, you've got to do more than just ask a question, because your job as an opposition is to show there's an alternative. If all you're saying is we want to know what you're doing so then we can think about it. No, he's already having meetings yeah. with the scientific advisors. If he's having meetings with the scientific advisors, he should be putting forward what he thinks the best strategy at this point in time should be. And also, this is the same guy that said, look, Labour can stop Brexit when they were the smaller party of the big two in Parliament. So if, if, how, how does Labour have the agency to stop Brexit? But Labour is the opposition. It can't have anything to do with perhaps... Uh, a better public health policy in regards to coronavirus. It's a weird, you know, all of a sudden, Labour had all this agency before in this massive historic mm. national issue, but now we've got no agency at all. We're just the opposition. Seems kind of dissonant and strange. Uh, maybe some people want to comment about that in the comments, ask some questions. Uh, I thought what was really weird for me was why 
why did he post it on his Twitter account? It was like a really bad interview. I was like, I was expecting something. I go, okay, this is, and I was like, you don't look good doing this. And I'm thinking, was this kind of, is this confirmation bias? Do I not want him to do well? Or, and then I saw other people saying, this is kind of weird, right? I mean, why would you share a video where you look, he did look out of his depth. Whereas on Sunday with Ma, he looked really good, really authoritative, obviously very well prepared. And I know it's obviously in a very busy few days, you have your shadow cabinet picks, et cetera, but it just looked, looked kind mm. of weak. Um, let's take some questions. Uh, Savoring Seasons asks, do you think the COVID caused recession will uh, be a get the Brexiteers off the hook for the economic contraction that was predicted due to Brexit? Michael. Um, well, I'm not sure how big a, a contraction we were expecting after Brexit in a way. I mean, apart from a no-deal Brexit, and I always thought the idea that we were still going to get one of those at the end of the year was a bit pie in the sky. It seems like the consequence of Brexit is more likely to be slightly lower long-term growth over quite a long period of time. It was actually quite possible that the moment at which you know we struck a deal, you could have investment sort of flooding back in. Mm. Um, it seems from the stats that Aaron was reading out earlier that that didn't happen to the degree that people were expecting. Um, so businesses didn't react to the certainty of Brexit and the certainty of a Brexit deal as as, as strongly as some may have hoped. Um, but in any case, I mean, I think what it's going to do is take the heat out of out of Brexit, right? People just have bigger things to worry about. Again, every every time uh, people, I suppose, who aren't avid Brexiteers, we always assume that whenever there's an opportunity for the government to go for a softer Brexit, they will. And this obviously would provide the political cover to do that. That's true. They, they, historically, they haven't done that. Historically, they haven't taken the opportunities to do a softer Brexit. So, you know. Or even Basically. harder Brexit. I mean, that gives them license to a lot of things, right? Yeah, I think it'd be harder to argue for a harder Brexit due to this. And I, I don't know how, how much of a hard Brexit they want. I feel no, like I just Brexit's going to become a less significant story now. I agree. I mean, savoring seasons, my response would be, uh, given the economic numbers we're seeing, minus five contraction for Q1, 15 to 25 for Q2. I mean, this, this blows Brexit out of the water. Brexit, fundamentally, I've always said the left hasn't got a good sort of mental image of what Brexit means as a catastrophe. It means slightly worse policies and things like, you know, freedom of movement. Um, it's not going to be the end of the world. And we, we saw that with the government's white paper on it. And it's going to mean maybe minus 2% decline and otherwise what would have been GDP growth for 20 years. But we already had a broken econ economic model anyway. We've already had no growth GDP per capita for a decade anyway. It wasn't like we, you know, we already had a failing economy with or without Brexit. Uh, so I, yeah, the premise of the question, I mean, COVID-19 is obviously going to be much shorter, 12 to 18 months, we hope. Uh, but the numbers we're looking at here are just, I mean, they, they blow breaks out of the water. Next question, Laura Martin. Will Navarra continue with these daily streams after the COVID crisis ends? Great question for Michael, because Tiski is your baby, isn't it, Michael? Well, we'll see. I mean, I'm I'm now hosting. We've sort of agreed this week. I'm going to do Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays as hosting. And then we'll see what we do with the other two days. So, so maybe it's up to you, actually, Aaron. I'll throw that straight back at you. I mean, in a way, it obviously depends on our income streams. Um, so, if you do want to, if you do want us to keep up these daily streams, <laughs> go to navaramedia.com forward slash support um, and donate the equivalent of one hour's wage a month, or give us a COVID nineteen bonus. I mean, I was just going to say, Michael and I. I mean, I, I think we're not we're not doing because we basically we we're meant to do three shows a week, right? Yes. And we're we're not paid to do five shows a week. And no, we do, yeah, yeah. No, and we decided no, but we decided to do that because a it's a politically important moment, and we want you know we want to grow Navarra Media. Uh, so help us do that. If we're going to make five shows a week permanent, it would require resources we presently don't have. That's those are just the facts. I mean, you're the, you're the Tisky big boss, so you tell me. Uh, well, as I say, I can do. I can. I'm I'm not doing extra work at the moment because I'm not. I don't have that much money to spend money. I don't have that much money. That's to, true. I don't have much to spend money on, let's say that. Next question. Next question. Uh, Lionel Henry, uh, do you think Boris will survive a public inquiry into COVID? Oh, big question, Lionel. Michael, what do you think? That's a very good question. Um, it, I mean, I think it's clear there's been a fuck up and the government are very nervous about it. Um, so one element of this that I think is going to look bad for them is that ultimately the government's original course of action, they had decided um, that 100,000 deaths was acceptable. And this seems undeniable at this point in time. So when there was that new modelling that came out, it said that actually the, the status quo, your current plans, no action at all would have caused half a million deaths. 
half a million deaths, your current plans would cause a quarter of a million deaths. That was an upgrade from 100,000. So the government, for a few months at least, were working on the assumption that 100,000 people would die. And I think they've kind of buried that fact. And when that comes to the surface, that's going to be very difficult for them to explain. And I think they're probably incredibly nervous about that. Whether that will reflect on Boris Johnson himself, I mean, has a lot to do with whether the media make it impossible for the blame to be passed along. Um, so in the and same way with with the Windrush, it was only when sort of campaigners made it an issue yeah. that it became an issue. Can I ask you a question in, in regards to... So clearly, I mean, there's one argument that says Starmer's strategy is to basically do nothing. And obviously an uncharitable reading is that that's because he's not a good politician. A charitable reading, um, which I would have had probably until I saw that into yesterday, of course, it's early days. It's changing from one day to the next. A charitable reading is he just wants to take a step back, let them sort of own this disaster for a couple of months and then come back into it with a bit more force. So to what extent, in terms of the people blaming the Tories for this, because as Basco already said, uh, governments across the world are actually, you know, they're seeing approval ratings rocket because of this crisis, even when they've utterly mishandled things, as is the case both here in the US. Uh, to what extent do you think Starmer's positioning will make a difference do you think if he does one thing, it'll let the Tories off the hook, or is the crisis so big that it kind of doesn't matter? Well, I think the issue is that, one, I think that it was opposition to the Conservatives' original herd immunity strategy, which made them move from it. So I do think that scrutiny, and not just the scrutiny that, that Keir Starmer seems to think scrutiny is asking questions. Scrutiny is saying, this looks to me like the wrong course of action for these reasons. Yeah. Can you explain why it's not? Not just say, what is your, you know, it, it can't just be an open question. It has to be a pointed question, which implies that you have seen a problem in what they're doing. And I think that, so, so one, I think proper scrutiny, not just asking questions, scrutiny will, will, will create better policy and lead to less deaths. But the other issue in terms of getting justice in the future is the more people who are implicated in mistakes that are made, the less likely you are to get justice because there are more people with an interest in sort of covering this up. No one really wants to talk about it. Now, if the Labour Party throughout this whole crisis have, have just nodded along and said, yep, that looks fine. Yep, that looks fine. Yep, that looks fine. Then, I mean, an inquiry isn't going to make them look very good because the whole point of an inquiry, like what an inquiry should find and <clears throat> over at least the last three weeks, or four weeks, and we can prove this because we've got all these videos, is that you know any idiot could realize <laughs> that this policy was incredibly high risk. Yeah. We've got videos that, where we're saying this policy is incredibly high risk. That was the ultimate decision they've come to. Because they came to it late, lots of people will die. And the Labour Party need to also put down, you know, in writing, we believe mm. this is incredibly high risk, the course of action you're taking. And I think unless they are willing to, to put those objections down on record they're going to be in a very weak position when the truth about this crisis comes out in in six months a year or two years time well i'm going to go to the final question but before i do i mean it's really important look at the iraq war the iraq war is a debacle it starts in 2003 it, it gets consent from both major parties uh you know the, the conservatives could have and should have ideally they would mm. have opposed a stupid war which cost lives and cost billions of pounds and they would have gained political capital from that and there's nothing wrong with that because it was the right thing to do. Mm. The government made a poor decision, which cost lives and it cost money. Uh, and and so you know that's that that to me offers an example of a historic mistake, which in no way redounded to the benefit of the opposition party because they just kind of nodded and went along with it. Maybe coronavirus would be no different if we don't see uh, what people love to call forensic opposition. Who knows? Um, this is from it's the last question. Uh, <laughs> This is a remarkable list of people. Hertage and Tube. What do you think about West Streeting, Stephen Kinnock, Liz Kendall, Jess Phillips, Tulip Sadiq all being back in the fold? So before you answer, Michael, Streeting has got a junior role in the Shadow Treasury team. Jess Phillips a role in the Shadow Home Affairs team. Liz Kendall, Shadow uh, Health Minister. I think she's, is she mental health or social care? Social care. Uh, Stephen who, Kinnock. Who was that, sorry? Uh, Liz Kendall. Liz Kendall, yep, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, Stephen Kinnock, uh, Shadow Foreign Minister. So, yeah, go back to those names again. Uh, West Streeting, Steve Kinnock, Liz Kendall, Jess Phillips, Tulip Sadiq, all outspoken critics of Jeremy Corbyn, most certainly not even on the centre left of the party. What do you make of them coming back into the fold, Michael Walker? Uh, well, I mean, if you so if you just look at that, that combination in the Shadow Treasury team, I mean, you can say, ah, oh, this has got Keir Starmer written all over it because he's he's found one of the most left-wing people in the parliamentary party, one of the most right-wing people, and put them in the same team. Um, both happen to be 
gay men of a similar age. That sort of they, they they look they seem almost like the mirror of each other. Um, but I think that's true in any case. Um, but uh, if you look at the whole gamut of of all the people he's he's put into the shadow ministerial <clears throat> team, it starts to look much more weighted towards the right of the party. And I think, as Stephen Bush pointed out today, your your junior ministers is where you get your talent pool from. So even though his shadow cabinet, as we talked about on Monday, is quite inoffensive, um, there are a lot of people as junior ministers and far more junior ministers who are from the factional right of the party than from the factional left of the party. There's, I think there's only sort of three or four people from the socialist campaign group, but loads of people from the progress wing. That does kind of suggest that where Keir Starmer sees his shadow cabinet in three years' time is to the right of where it currently is now. And do you think that, do you think that's the case? Probably, yeah. I mean, I, I don't have much reason to believe otherwise. You know, it, it doesn't seem like he has... You know, for example, Clive Lewis doesn't have a job as a junior or, minister. Or Dawn, or Dawn Butler, which or I just... Or Dawn Butler. Been. Kate Ossimore. You know, people who he could be you know, building up as potential candidates for a future shadow cabinet. None of them are there. Bell Ribeiro. Bell Ribeiro, yeah, exactly. I, I mean, it's, it's, a lot of, it's kind of, it's one, one thing I just want to say quickly is, and it, it got me angry before we came on air, is that this is a party which has the two times black women have run, they came last, Diane Abbott and Dawn Butler. You've just had a shadow cabinet full of black and brown people. It's now less uh, diverse than it was. Uh, and it's a party that has never elected a woman as, as its leader while the Tories have done it twice. And, you know, that, there does come a point where you think to yourself, to what extent can the Labour Party really claim it's this party for minorities? You know, you heard it repeatedly when Jeremy Corbyn was leader. We're an anti-racist party. Uh, and as I've been so keen to point out, whether it was opening Yarl's Wood, whether it was war in Iraq, whether it was some of the rhetoric around campaigning uh, between 2005, 2010, which particularly focused on Muslim communities. Um, Phil Woolis lost his seat because of it. Uh, I, I, I look at this and I wonder, how does Labour think that Bain people will respond? Are they taking Bain votes for for granted, or or what? Mike, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I think the shadow cabinet proper, in terms of gender and ethnicity, was more diverse than Corbyn's. Not one hundred percent sure about that, but I think that's the case. No, I it most certainly was. Yeah, I haven't I haven't looked up in terms of the the junior ministerial positions. I don't know if it's more or less diverse. I saw on Twitter, which I thought was a very reasonable critique that the whole home office team um is white um so in an age you know of windrush that seems like a bit of an oversight um but i mean in terms of how you know i've i've looked through it and what i've paid particular attention to is where they're they're factional where, where they sit on the on the factional spectrum of the labor party so in a way i haven't looked deep enough into it to say how it you know fits in terms of other other issues, but it, but it is a worry, isn't it? That sort of the, the we talked about this the other day. You know, people who weren't just Lisa Nandy wanted to respect the vote; she wanted to leave the European Union. There were other people who had a different analysis. They're not in it. Uh, you have a, 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 a white man from the southeast of England who's the leader. You've got a shadow cabinet which is less Bain. Uh, you've got a lady, very talented woman, Dawn Butler, who ran for the deputy leadership. She's she's not got any role. Uh, it, I mean, it just seems to me. It seems like a, it is an oversight. I'm, not, I'm sure it's not intentional, but it does seem to me you that know, a lot of votes right now, whether it's the SNP, Labour, the Tories, a lot of the electorate's very soft. The only bit of the electorate which isn't soft for Labour are, well, the two bits of the electorate which aren't soft for Labour are, are BAME voters and young people. Uh, and these are the two bits of their vote which they just seem to be taking for granted right now. I mean, early days could obviously change, but uh, do, you think that's a, do you think that's a concern? Well, obviously, it's a concern. I mean, as I say, I haven't really... If, if the shadow cabinet is more diverse than the previous one, it's hard to complain. Um, and I haven't looked deep enough into the junior ministerial posts. As I say, the Home Office seems like a bit of an oversight. But... Michael, as always, uh, you're, uh, you're as charitable as ever, which is what makes you such a great commentator. Um, it was something that's really got my back up before we came on out, so I had to, I had to vent. Uh, we have been going live for an hour and five. We started slightly late. We're back tomorrow. You're interviewing Nadia Witter, Michael. Is that right? Yes. Um, who is incredibly well placed for a show um, in this moment, much like Lara McNeil, because she has two hats, which are both incredibly relevant um, to politics in, in the coronavirus crisis. Nadia Whittam is, on the one hand, the youngest MP in Parliament, um, and on the other is a care worker and has gone 
back to work part time in care. So that'll be a great show. Great. Looking forward to it. Any other guests tomorrow? Or is it just her? I'll confirm that later. Good. Uh, well, I guess I'm not going to be joining you tomorrow. So I'll see our audience on Monday. You've been watching or listening to Tisky Sour. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. It's been a thank pleasure. You, thank you all out there. Good night. Thank you.